Hi, my name is Patrick Johnson. Um, I'm a film and TV composer, um, and I've just released my first solo album, Suddenly We Look Like Giants. I first started, uh, well, I studied at Berklee College of Music uh, in Boston, first of all, and I kind of then decided that I wanted to be a film composer. I started off as a, a guitarist, and I majored in just performance. I decided early on that I liked the whole aspect of composition and harmony and all that, that side of things and how it married with picture. And so I, I studied that for a couple of years. Then I moved to London afterwards, and I felt like I had a pretty good grounding in the theoretical aspect of film scoring and all that kind of thing, but I was pretty lacking in um, on the technical side, like production and recording and mixing and that, all that stuff. I applied to a few recording studios and uh, luckily got a job at one of them called Ignition Studios, which was in, um, in North London. I kind of worked in there for a couple of years, and then the guy who was the head engineer there left. And so by... By default, I became the head engineer, so I kind of had to fake it for a little while until I actually understood what I was doing. So I was recording a lot of bands and, and artists there, and that was a really good chance to learn a lot of the technical aspects of it all and got a good kind of grounding in recording and, and mixing and w learning what compression was and EQ and all that side of things. And then by some turn of fate, a filmmaker came in. His name was Orlando, and he was going to get his film mixed uh, by me at the studio. But then I managed to talk to him a little bit and we were discussing a little bit about his film and I said that I'd love to score it. So it happened that I got to score his film. And Orlando later on kept on using me for his uh, future projects afterwards and he went on to make some beautiful films. His first feature, which I scored, um, went on to be nominated for an Academy Award. In amongst all of that, I was working for Spitfire as well at the same time. Um, uh, as a developer at that time. I started when Spitfire was still fairly small. I knew Christian a little bit, and then I got to know Paul and uh, Stan and some of the early guys that were there. And then, um, yeah, they just welcomed me into the family. And uh, it was a great opportunity for me because to be around people who were doing, were, were around sco the scoring process professionally, it really um, taught me how things are done properly, if you know what I mean. Like, there's no proper way to do it, but... I just learned how other people were doing things, so I, I learned a ton that way. And they were really warm and open with information and recommending me for opportunities and things. I started to get a little more busy with the scoring stuff on my own, so I had to part ways with Spitfire, unfortunately. But that gave me more time to focus on my own composition. And during all that period of scoring films and, all, and TV series and stuff, I... I managed to somehow, I, now I don't know how I did it because I'm pretty busy nowadays, but I found time to actually do a, a solo album, which I always felt was a a way to kind of explore into myself. Because when I work on films and TV series, I, I always tend to try and empathize and embody other people's stories and, and um, just try and support other narratives, you know, um, and also you have the aid of kind of the visuals and all that kind of thing, which really guides you. Whereas I wanted to see if I could challenge myself to, to try and tell something a little more personal. So that brings me to where I have this album now. Suddenly we look like giants. My main instrument, I guess I would have to say, is probably guitar. Because that's what I, like when I went, you know, originally to study music, it was guitar. And I was sitting, you know, six to eight hours every day, like singing guitar, guitar, guitar. Since then, I've kind of drifted away from guitar. Like I, st I still, you know know how to play it and stuff, but I find myself more in front of the piano nowadays because of how we work electronically with computers, you know, it's the way we input information mostly. So, but I wouldn't call myself a, a piano player. There are piano players that are far better than I am, but, but I do find that kind of somehow my limitations on piano let me have my own way to do that. And um, by com coming from the perspective of a guitar, at some of the voicings that you do, which you can do on guitars, which are, they're a bit more bizarre on piano, but they're quite nice. Also, I like the idea of shaking it up as much as possible because it's if you get stuck in a certain way, then your muscle memory takes over rather than chance being allowed to kind of reign, if you know what I mean. So I like to start a pr new project with, I try to think of sonics, like a lot more than sort of harmony or instrumentation. Uh, instrumentation plays into sonics, of course, but like, what does a piano through a space echo sound sound like? Or what does a road through a space echo sound like? Or what if you reverse that? What if you, 
you, I don't know, like you add a vocal on top of that and just find combinations of things that become new things. So I don't have any kind of, I can't play those things, but you just play around until inside the computer, I guess the computer becomes the instrument at that stage because you're, you're kind of like doing little puzzle pieces together to try and find what, what does it sound like sonically, like, and emotionally, how does that resonate? So the process on, on the first uh, record was, um, I approached it a lot in the way that I do a film score, um, except that there was nothing to look at and no story or anything. So that's the thing that I found most difficult about the process of doing the solo album versus working to something that already exists is how do I start writing music that actually has a purpose rather than just music for music's sake. And so that's where I had to kind of discover first before I, I wrote about 50 songs for this album and I managed to cut it down to 10 songs um, because I felt that if I was going to do this, then I needed to everything to resonate correctly with me. And I tried to really put on that hat where your filter is really strong and you don't let things through that you don't stand by. The process for me was first of all, just a lot of frustration that the things I was writing weren't good enough. And then trying to figure out what little aspects of a whole piece, like a whole piece, oh, that little part's interesting. So forget everything else, start from there. And then you start building and building until eventually you have something that you, you feel like, at least I like it. And then for the rest of the people, who knows, we'll see. But at least it means something to me and it resonates in terms of the narrative that I'm trying to tell, uh, the story that I'm trying to project across the album as a whole. So I wanted the whole album to feel really unified. As soon as I had all that, most of that stuff was written on piano and, all, and various other instruments, guitars. But that idea that I was talking about earlier about in terms of just playing with sonics and seeing what's, what's possible sonically and what, what inspires me, to, to try and do that, to try and inspire myself, I actually booked studio time at a few different studios. First, I booked one studio in London called The Pool. Then I booked another one called Sleeper Sound. Then I booked uh, Aerodale, I think it was. I booked a studio on Holloway Road near where I was living at the time. And then I did a lot of stuff in my own place. So I just did these like sound collection sessions, basically full days, uh, pretty much, of just collecting sounds. I went in with nothing written at all. And I just collected things that 90% of the sounds that I got weren't great, but maybe, you know, some of it was interesting and started the basis for, for tracks that I thought were, were interesting and unique because everything was created from scratch. And so I did that. Then I went home and to the studio and just kind of chiseled away at it until something emerged. And then I mocked it all up because I knew I wanted to have strings and, and live piano. So they all wanted to be live. So I mocked up the piano with samples and I mocked up the strings with samples as well, a string quartet. But the the quartet, like the sounds, I didn't, because I wasn't demoing it for some anyone else, like for a director, like I normally would, where I spend a lot of time mixing and stuff. Because I was just demoing it for myself, the, the demo sounded shocking. But then as soon as you get the real players on there, it just transforms everything. So out of those studios that I recorded at, I decided Sleeper Sounds, uh, it's a beautiful studio. I decided that that was the place we wanted to do it because they aren't used to really recording strings and oh, I mean bigger groups at once that aren't um, like they're not set up like a, a studio that records film scores basically. So and it's an open live room, so we're in the same room as the players. So I like that communication. I like the chaos of that a little bit. So I wanted a place that was a little bit out of control in that sense. It was difficult as a result of that, but it was also special as a result of that, I think. So so we did that and uh, the engineer, Nick Taylor, helped me out um, with the recording and then he later mixed it. And before the mixing, I took it up to the very last stage of as far as I could take it, I felt mixing wise and arrangement wise. And then I got my friend Brett Cox in to do to kind of produce the album and to, uh, you know, give me his experience and, and look across the whole thing as a whole and help me shape certain segments in better ways. And as soon as I got it back from him, it was just, it had a different life to it that I was loving. We got back in the studio, did another mix session with Nick Taylor at Airedale. Uh, these studios are in London. And then um, 
Then we took it to Air Studios, also in London, and uh, mastered it with Cicely Balston. And uh, she did an amazing job. And what you hear, you know, the final product is, is thanks to her and the amazing kind of final touches that she was giving. And that's the full lifespan of the album. Getting the album finally then released out into the world is, is, um, is an interesting and tricky process and something that was really new to me. Because when I'm working in, in film and television land, then I, you know, you hand it over and it, it has life in tandem with the film or the TV series that you're working on. And then the separate soundtrack that can go very, via various record labels. When you're doing it as a solo artist, the, the process for, first of all, getting a label to be interested in you is, is a complicated and difficult process. There are, there's a lot of wonderful music out there and you have to kind of find a way that makes your perspective on this thing a little bit different from other people. I didn't know much about it before I started, but I had, had some great guidance from some really close friends who have done this kind of thing before and they really, I think that's the one thing I would say is ask for help, ask people for advice. And that's what I did at least, and it really helped me. And some direct introductions essentially led to me having the meeting that got me signed to Phases, the label which I'm signed to at the moment. And they're wonderful. And in terms of actually getting everything out um, to a place where the public can hear it, they handle all of that stuff. And, you know, they, they handle all the logistics and the contractual side, and they deal with sync and all these important things that help after the album is done to, to get it to reach the right places and also to recoup some, some money from the expenses that you've uh, incurred to make the album in the first place as well. If you can get a record label involved, fantastic. You know, I, that's certainly what I think what we all would like, but sometimes that's not always an option or not always the best route and self-releasing and finding someone to help you distribute can be a really, viable option. I've seen people who have done really great things just by self-releasing and finding uh, someone to, um, finding a good publicist, just someone who can help with PR and push, push it out to the right channels and stuff. And sometimes that can be more effective because you can be really targeted with exactly what you're trying to achieve uh, personally and, you know, with your particular album. So I think research is key, you know, do lots of research. There's a lot of there are a lot of resources on the, online now for how you can navigate all this stuff, but the best resource has got to still be someone who's actually done it themselves. If you know such a person or you don't contact them, and people are usually pretty generous with information like that, I, I find.